Oasis Audio presents Through a Man's Eyes by Shanti Feldhahn and Craig Gross, read for you by the author. Dedication From me to the men and boys who work to take every thought captive in a challenging culture, on behalf of wives and moms everywhere, we honor you. From Craig to all wives and mothers, thank you for taking the time to understand the inner lives of the males in your life. We are very grateful for you. Chapter 1. What Men See Just for a moment, we want you to step with us into a pair of shoes that in real life you will never wear. Those of a man in your life. Maybe those shoes belong to your husband or boyfriend, maybe your son, maybe your brother or father or close friend. We want to take you on a tour of what life looks like to men from the inside. Why would you want or need this tour? Because you're not a guy. And as a result, you're missing a huge part of the life experienced by your husband, boyfriend, or son, or any other man in your life, your boss, your pastor, your neighbor. He faces some major challenges. They are in his face every single day. These challenges often come with consequences for him, for you, and for your relationship, yet you might be completely unaware that they even exist. Even for the most noble, honorable men, they exist. Yet once your eyes are opened to these challenges, the potential consequences, and how to handle them, everything changes. You will understand how men see life in certain ways and why. You will understand the impact, both the negative and the positive, that it could have on their relationships with you and others. And you will know what you can do to provide support, prevent problems, and address any issues that have arisen. But that comes later. For now, Set it all aside and come with us on that tour of what life looks like for men. Literally, looks like. We are going to experience a summer day in the life of a fairly typical guy whom we will call Jack. Now, let me mention that from this point forward in the book, we will be talking about some issues pretty frankly, and that includes, for the next few minutes, some scenes that will paint some vivid pictures for you as the woman listener. Nothing inappropriate, of course, but direct. So if there are men listening in, you may, in some cases, want to fast forward to the commentary portion of the chapter. So now, back to our fairly typical guy named Jack. Jack is 30 years old, and he is a good guy who takes his faith seriously. He's been married for two years, doesn't have kids yet, and works in commercial real estate in a mid-sized city. He went to bed late the night before and has a full day ahead. 6.30 a.m. Beep, beep, beep. After silencing his alarm, Jack reluctantly opens his bleary eyes and lies in bed for a minute, trying to wake up. He hears the shower running in the master bathroom a few feet away and the watery sounds of his wife humming happily. An image of what she looks like right now standing there in the spray jumps to his mind and he feels his body respond. He smiles as he remembers what she looked like in this bedroom late last night and he savors a few mental images. Yes, they went to sleep a bit later than anticipated, but it was worth it. The sound of the shower shutting off snaps him out of his reverie. Jack swings out of bed and heads towards the bathroom. As he pushes open the door, he sees his wife hastily wrapping a towel around herself, ah, oh, what a shame, and smiles at her as he says good morning. He gives her a sweet kiss on top of her wet head. She always looks embarrassed to be seen with no clothes on. My butt is too big and my boobs are too small, she always says. But he loves stealing glances at her when he can. He savors every image of her that he has from their wedding night onward. His brain starts to imagine what she looks like under that towel, but he shuts down that train of thought. No sense making himself crazy. She's running to work, and so is he. Shaking the thought out of his head, he steps into the shower and resolutely forces himself to think about the tasks of the busy day ahead. 8.30 a.m., downtown. Morning! Jack and his colleagues greet each other as they enter the office building. As the elevator doors open onto the third floor, he notes which colleagues are already there and which cubes are empty. 
He'll be leaving shortly for the big review meeting at the DeMarco Hotel site, and given the tension with the client, he needs some paperwork from each of his colleagues, but he doesn't see... Cole, where is Cole? I need his numbers before I leave. He said he'd have them to me by now. For the next hour, he finds it hard to concentrate, as his eyes continually flick between the clock and the elevator bank. Then an elevator door opens, and his colleague, Abby, comes striding down the corridor. In a nanosecond, it is as if a spotlight is shining on her well-endowed figure and her crisp white blouse. As usual, she seems to have missed doing up those top two buttons. A giant invisible magnet instantly draws Jack's eyes to the top of her lacy bra and the perfect form inside. And as usual, in that nanosecond, he has two powerful forces wrestling within him. He feels a tightening in his gut and a temptation to consume that pleasurable image for as long as he can before Abby sees him. But he also wants to honor his wife and God in his thought life, and to respect Abby as a person and a colleague. Jack wrenches his head away. Knowing Abby is about to walk directly past his cubicle, he turns his chair slightly so his back faces the door. That way she's less likely to stop for some polite morning chit-chat. For a few moments, he stares blankly at the DeMarco Hotel paperwork on his desk, extremely aware of the fact that Abby is walking past him right now. He fights a desire to turn around and take a look at her back view, which is usually interesting, too. He breathes a sigh of relief when the sound of her heels fades from earshot. Now, the only problem is that he has to fight several attempts made by other images of Abby, other outfits, other glimpses, to intrude on the screen of his mind. Each time another unbidden image appears, he resolutely refocuses on the DeMarco numbers. He's having trouble concentrating on them. What else can he think about to distract himself? What's his next task again? Oh, right, Cole's numbers. He looks back to the elevator just as Cole rushes in. Jack quickly intercepts his colleague to get his report and then heads out the door. 9.47 a.m., somewhere on the highway. Jack hates this stretch of road. In order to get to the new resort hotel site, he has to drive 50 miles outside the city, and at least 10 billboards along the way advertise so-called gentlemen's clubs. He has never been to one, but multiple television shows and movies have shown girls dancing around stripper poles, which sends his memory back to those images whenever a new billboard appears. On each billboard, the smoldering eyes of the 15-foot-high seductive woman try to draw his gaze, eyes that say, I want you. Since Jack can't look the other direction for too long without crashing the car, he does what his dad once taught him to do. He keeps his eyes resolutely on the road and prays for the young women who are trapped in those professions. And a few miles on, he does that again, and again, and again. 10.30 a.m., the new resort hotel site outside the city. As Jack steps out of his car and begins walking down the path between the new hotel and the one next door, he hears some boisterous young voices. About 10 yards ahead of him, he sees five or six teenage girls come out of the hotel next door and head towards the pool. All are wearing bikinis and have clearly been in and out of the pool a few times already. Jack again feels that desire to look. Because he's behind the girls, he could look with impunity and feel the pleasure of consuming all those exhilarating images, but thankfully he has ammunition. He looks away from the girls and calls to mind instead that other intoxicating image, that one of his wife last night. He savors it like a delicious drink for a moment, allowing his mind to view it in slow motion. By the time the path reaches the door of the hotel, the girls are no longer in sight, he lost track of where they went, and he is grinning to himself and feeling a great rush of affection for his wife. 11.15 a.m., halfway through the meeting. Jack is trying to sort through the contradictory numbers and differing stories shared by his on-site manager and the hotel manager. Were the cost overruns actually authorized by the client or weren't they? His client pauses the meeting for a second to send a quick text message to someone. He tells Jack, I've just asked Dion, our financial officer, to come in and share her paper trail, so you see that we simply never approved these additional expenditures. A moment later, the door opens and Jack does a double take and then relaxes. 
Dion is a beautiful woman with flowing dark hair, chocolate brown eyes, and an eye-catching white suit. And even in that split second, Jack can tell that she probably has a great figure. But Dion is polished and professional without being provocative. Her suit is pretty, but it isn't tight. Her top doesn't show a thing, and when she sits down next to Jack to work through a series of spreadsheets, her skirt is long enough that it doesn't ride up. Jack breathes a sigh of relief and then focuses on the complex numbers as she takes him through the client's version of the paper trail. Thirty minutes later, he isn't fully convinced, but it is clear Dion has done her homework and she has made a good case. He stands up, shakes her hand, and tells her so. I can't promise we're going to come down on your side, but we're going to take a much harder look at some of these numbers, he says as he takes his leave. 1 p.m., back at the downtown office. The next few hours are tough. Back at the office, he has trouble concentrating on what Abby is saying as she and Cole walk him through the other side of the DeMarco numbers. And later, when images of Abby's form pop up in his mind, he resolutely tears them down by thinking about his wife, the DeMarco numbers, or getting the car transmission serviced. And then during his break, he has to deal with the sidebar pop-ups on various social media sites during the few moments he spends online. Next, there's the after-work trip through the auto shop, where the magazines in the waiting room include old copies of Maxim. Jack stands up and walks around for a while, until he realizes that the pictures on the walls include pinups. And during the drive home, the news radio station airs a commercial for The Little Pill When the Time is Right, and images of when the time was right began to play in his brain. By the time Jack pulls into the driveway, it is nearly 8 p.m., and he is hungry for more than just food. After dinner, as he helps clean up the kitchen, he comes up behind his wife and gives her a big hug and his hands begin to wander. She playfully slaps his hand and chuckles, you only have one thing on your mind, don't you? Hey, I was going to tell you, Scott and Josie are interested in looking at the bikes this weekend if you really do want to sell them. Jack smiles ruefully to himself and drags his mind back to what his wife is saying and away from where it wants to go. But maybe tomorrow night, he thinks...